movie, it also came with two other movies, The Devil Incarnate and Phobia. And I haven't watched them, but uh, you let me know what you guys think about that. And you guys let me know that yes, you would like me to take a look at these two movies. Even if you didn't, I probably would have done it anyways. So, and I have to say, after watching both movies, I really didn't expect this at all. I actually had to massively adjust my script at one point. You'll later find out why, but this is how I'm gonna do it. I wanna present this first review in the same pattern experience that I had with the movie. From going into the movie with no information, not watching any trailers, to now watching the movie multiple times and also having all this extra research under my belt. I hope you enjoy this. Edmondson? It's cold, McKinley. It's cold. It's Vikings War of Clans. This game was inspired by the famous strategy and RPG games of the 90s. And the 90s were dope. Where are my 94 babies at? We're getting old. What makes Vikings World so addictive is that more than 20 million online players are constantly changing the way the game evolves by never ending fighting over resources, forging new alliances, and competing in live events. Please let our wonderful sponsor know that you support my channel by downloading Vikings for free in the links below. And also with my link, you'll get a special bonus of 200 gold coins and also a protective shield. And also, just between you and me, Vikings is holding a contest on their Instagram page soon where you could win not one, not two, not three, not, f well, four, drones. Three DJI Sparks and one DJI Phantom. Link to their Instagram page also below. Now let's watch Phobia. All of their wardrobes are the stuff that they brought that then they and Trina co coordinated together to decide what they should wear. Why is he, what? So this is, yeah, what, I mean, what is he doing with the celery? celery? He fucking threw it out, man. Yeah. Why is he throwing out the celery? <laughs> The, he was supposed what, to scrap he, they didn't the, pass uh, his the, the ends, and, <laughs> and he didn't. He he, did, he scrapped the wrong thing by accident. Right, he's so into the moment. He's just like ah, uh, choppity chop. Yeah. We're lucky he didn't cut his fingers off. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck the cute intro. Oh my. This movie sucks, and it doesn't regular funny suck. It's just boring as all hell. Where do I start with this thing? The main menu? Cause that's a mess. <laughs> Am I supposed to be scared? Take a note from any other horror movie. When main menus were a thing, you really wanted to set the tone right off the bat. For example, the menu to Juan makes you not even want to watch the movie. The main menu for the original wit is simple, but creepy, effective. Fun fact, the writer and singer of the song that you're listening to is actually a main character in our next movie. You're welcome. I'm sure you care. By the way, as soon as I saw the cover, I knew the movie was gonna have nothing to do with the cover. Let's see if they prove me wrong. So you press play and the movie opens up with the same song from the main menu. It's even in the credits. I now love it. Is there something more? We are immediately introduced to Dweeby Post Malone coming to after a car accident. His name's Jonathan, but the people who like him call him Mac. Now Mac suffers from agoraphobia, which is the fear of places and situations that might cause panic, helplessness, or embarrassment. For Mac, his agoraphobia is directed to the outside world, so he stays locked in day after day doing the same monotonous bullshit on his computer, trying to just earn a living to pay his $5,000 in student loans that did nothing for him. Mac's an at-home stenographer who has a built for TV therapist. PSA, if you have this type of chin, you're almost required by law to be a weatherman. That, or you're the man whore on soap operas, or Butch Hartman. So Big Chin tells him to stop being soft and start dealing with the outside. But as you can see, Mac can barely handle the sunlight from a window. He's got it pretty bad. His best friend Taylor randomly stops by here and there to spend some time with him. And Taylor tells Mac he got him someone new to deliver his groceries. A girl, Bree. Sorry, it takes like 20 minutes for anything to happen, so let me just set it up. So Bree delivers his zebra cakes and is like, wait, you're not in a wheelchair? You don't look mentally disabled completely? What gives? Well, Bree, 
I'm scared of skies of blue and clouds of wood. Let's talk about Brie. Brie is a petite rebel Wilson with Drew Barrymore's voice. You know, I'm so sorry. God, I'm such an idiot. I just- Changed my mind. On a podcast I listened to, one of the executive producers mentioned that they just lost a patch of audio after filming. Someone on the crew just fucked up and they had to bring in the actors to re-record their lines. I mean, you know, most people I'm paid to bring groceries to are confined to a better wheelchair. You, you seem completely fine. I haven't been outside in over a year. I'm agoraphobic. This whole scene is dubbed. Badly. Man, agoraphobia. I mean, that's gotta be really hard. Not really, it's just the boredom that hurts the most. I have a TV, movies, internet. All the wonders of the modern world. This movie doesn't have a lot of jump scares. It has startling parts, but they're not accompanied by an onomatopoeia on steroids. They just happen. The only jump scares are scenes like this. It's just all mirror shots. So finally, let's jump into something interesting. The Devil Incarnate is a movie. Mac hears a noise, goes downstairs, and sees some nut job in the house with a knife. The guy bum rushes him and Mac hides. And this is where we meet definitely not a replica of the woman from Insidious. Everyone dies, Jonathan. The crazy guy just gently knocks him over and drags him somehow. <laughs> you got a lot of grip from that receding hairline. A lot to grab onto. All right. Who cares? No, it looks good. It's a good shot. No. The maniac tells him this isn't real, along with other crazy shit, and Mac hits a combo breaker and shanks him. Mac calls 911, the creepy lady appears, and the body disappears. Then Mac does his best simple Jack impression from Tropic Thunder. Everything okay? Um. I'm okay. I'm okay. Well, this sequence obviously brings up some questions. So was he asleep, hallucinating? It's really confusing. A lot of the times the audience sees things that he doesn't. Doesn't really match up. He even feels pain that then disappears. Ah! Brie visits again with groceries and Mac continues to be weird. I got them at the local green market. I know that they're not on your list or anything, but I just kind of figured, you know, who doesn't like all natural pretzels, right? Thank you. Wait, local? Yeah. Oh, Taylor didn't tell you? I really don't live far from here. No, he didn't mention it. What is this pedo smile you keep following up your sentences with? Brie accidentally opens up one of the blinds and shocks Mac. Even though in this scene, he's fucking A-OK. -okay. Directly in the sunlight. Man, that's fake ass Twilight. That's when the same crazy guy from earlier bursts into the room and- Brie, we need to go. We need to get out here. Brie! But everyone dies, Jonathan. Hey, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Okay, so by now you're probably starting to realize that this guy is going through some shit. Like seeing his wife walking down the street, even though she's dead. Jane? Like making out with his naked wife, even though she's dead. Jane? Still counts. <laughs> There's a lot of times in this movie where I laughed, where I probably wasn't supposed to, in scenes like this. Damn it. Now this trilogy of movies are all horror movies, right? But this movie doesn't really scare me. And I'm actually easily scared. I probably don't come off that way, but I am. I think it has to do with my obsessive paranoia of most things, as well as that I'm just easily startled. Jump scares will get me to jump, even though I see them coming. I'm just, duh. And I think that's why I like taking shots at horror movies. It's kind of like my way of fighting back, especially bad ones, because you get to see the stupid funny side of this genre. But I digress. Now this scene here is probably the scariest in the movie to me, because this shit is what scares me. Some creepy figure just chilling in the background. There's no jump scare cue. The movie doesn't tell you she's there. You make the discovery on your own. And also, this is important. I fucking hate the voice filter on the lady. It completely ruins any chance of her being scary. You did not need a filter. I would have preferred her real voice. That probably would have been a thousand times better. It's just so phony. It's what I would use to signify a villain in a skit. But everyone dies, Jonathan. Everyone dies, Jonathan. Everyone dies. Who are you? What are you doing in my home?
<laughs> and that is the only thing that even kind of relates to the cover. And I'm pretty sure it was just completely coincidental. So Brie comes over because that's just literally what this movie is, just Brie coming over. Hold on, I'm coming! She comes over because she wanted to hang out and Mac's like, let me cook you the famous Mac special. She questions Mac and we get the backstory as to why he's like this. Turns out him and his wife were debating to go to a party one night and Mac really wanted to go so he forced her to go as well. He then insisted on driving back even though he was incredibly tired and because he was so fatigued, he got T-boned by a car killing his wife. That was delicious. What did you even make? Celery tomato casserole? <sighs> so what are you in the mood to do now? How about now we have some fun. He just told you he murdered his wife after a party that most likely had alcohol. What are you gonna do next? Tear down all the curtains in the house? Now we get a nice little relationship development scene. And listen, I don't smoke. I don't know anything about smoking, but uh, this looks like some bullshit. <sighs> Did the Hulk roll this joint? This isn't even like kickback drinking. This is like I'm going to impregnate you drinking. They're just slamming shots. And slamming shots is the number one cause of not pulling out. And oh look, surprise, surprise. No, 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 we don't need a kind of baby, it's fine. You know why they call me Mac? Cause I don't get viruses. <laughs> don't worry, I'll pull out. I know how to time out. <laughs> it's been a while. Mac wakes up the next morning next to Jane, his wife. Good morning, sleeping beauty. Even though she's dead. <laughs> Well, who else would I be? Certainly hope you don't have other women in this bed when I'm not around. No. <laughs> Come on, Mac. Lying to your wife is one thing. Lying to your dead wife is another. <laughs> what was that for? Nothing. I just had a really bad dream. Is that what you call a really bad dream? How good is your really good dream? Well, why don't you put some clothes on and I'll go ahead and make some breakfast. Oh, I can think of some better things to do first. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan McKinley, you fucking savage. You just gingerly clapped cheeks like two minutes ago. You discover your wife is alive and the first thing you want to do is give her encore dick? For shame. <laughs> Listen, if my girl made eggs like this, I'd probably fall asleep while driving too. So as you can tell, reality and fiction are no longer discernible at this point. We don't know what the fuck is going on. But this cute fantasy is short-lived as all hell breaks loose. Literally everything and everyone is messing with Mac to the point where he starts cutting himself, only to be saved by his wife, even though she's dead. Maybe. Jane then randomly turns naked and bloody. Boobs! I don't really see the added effect of her being nude, but still smashing. She constantly makes him feel guilty, placing the blame on him for her death, also saying everyone dies. That's when this guy shows up. I can tell you're a therapist. Who blames Mac's hallucinations on his use of alcohol and weed in combination with his pills. But then, oh wait, what's this? What's happening? This light shove apparently takes out Crimson Chin. Which doesn't make a lick of sense, but what does at this point? Bree shows up, or does she? And she's all lovey-dovey, but Mac has like two killings under his belt at this point, and he's going crazy. Not to mention, Trevor from Fresh Prince is still dead on the floor like 10 feet away. So Mac's yelling at Bree to leave, and she thinks he just played her, and you see the misunderstanding here. Mac doesn't know what's real, so he calls his therapist's phone, and his therapist doesn't pick up, trying to prove to himself whether what is happening is real or not. So determining that this is real, he drags the body to his basement, only to see that his knife wound has disappeared. Also, Chet Ubecha has disappeared and reappeared, and everything continues to be banana crazy. This movie is literally just this guy panting and catching his breath, riveting. So Mac's obviously not a fan of what's happening, so he tries to overdose, and he can't even do that. He awakes to see his body rotting before him. Jane confronts him again, and Mac finally shows her what time it is and continuously clocks her in the face. She also weirdly eggs him on as he does it too, and then she becomes unresponsive and disappears. So now Mac thinks he has the upper hand on whatever is terrorizing him, proclaiming that he's not playing this game anymore. This isn't real. What is it? And oh look who it is. The guy with the crispy white tee from Walmart. Mac threatens him immediately and the guy actually seems terrified this time and pleads with him even though Mac's now beyond the point of reason. So Mac stabs him and even throws in an everyone dies. Ah! 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 Ah!
shows up. Because anyone can just show up to this guy's house. Who cares? She looks over and screams at the sight of the body and Max sees that the body on the floor is actually Taylor's, his best friend. Max chases down Bree telling her that none of this is real and everything will be okay and he suffocates her in the process. Then this happens. Stop it. Do you hear me? This isn't real. I'm afraid it is. Everyone dies. I'm not afraid anymore. Goodbye, Jonathan. classic run out to run over combo. You don't see that in every movie that has a road. Now Max gonna die. And you're probably waiting for me to be like, oh wait, but then he wakes up and it was all a dream. But uh, no, there's 50 seconds left in the movie. Enjoy. Whatever you do, don't listen. Hey man, just take it easy. That ambulance is gonna be here in two seconds. Buddy. with me phobia i need one of those stupid endings explained videos on youtube asap okay so after my first viewing which i'll be fair i didn't pay a whole lot of attention during i was confused as hell i get we weren't supposed to know what was real and what wasn't but i felt like by the end of the movie the director just put a turd in my hand and said figure it out during my second viewing i started to become angry because as the movie progressed I started to think that this was all just one big pretentious mess through most of the movie I didn't really get the hallucinations involvement I mustered up some guesses but I think I'm really just thinking too much into it did the woman symbolize death that's why she was dressed somewhat like a widow to imply that Mac would soon be dead was his wife merely just an embodiment of self-guilt he could never let go which contributed to never getting better with his condition was the maniacal intruder the embodiment of what he believed to be the dangers of the outside world coming in We'll never know. It's, those sound like pretty good fucking guesses. I'm analytical as fuck, but I don't think they really meant for any of that. So this is what I think I got for sure. This is my perspective. Let's rewind a bit. Mac initially meets the crazy guy who is already on the edge of insanity like we would later see Mac. The crazy guy even word for word reiterates what Mac later says when he has him in the same position of near murder. It's okay. This isn't real. I just want this to be over. No, please don't do this. Oh, that's good. You just keep trying. I don't want to die. Everyone dies! Shh, this isn't real. It's okay, I just want this to be over. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> oh, that's good. You just keep trying. We both know it's way beyond that point. Please, Mac. I don't want to die. Everyone dies. And after being stabbed, he tells Mac to not listen. Whatever you do. Don't listen. Then after dying, you can see this guy was rotting as well and even wearing the same fucking outfit, which I think the matching outfit is just because of no budget, but we'll roll with it. So I think this is basically a heavy ass foreshadow into what will happen to Mac. And although the don't listen line didn't entirely make sense to me in every scenario, I took it as to not listen to this bitch, constantly saying, everyone dies because her actions secretly drive Mac into solidifying her statement by not listening to her he wouldn't feed into her but he did eventually killing the hallucination of his wife as she eggs him on which in turn drove him to the point of murdering his best friend and newfound lover everyone dies when met with the crazy guy again his demeanor is entirely different actually scared and now addressing Jonathan as Mac also at one point I thought the man was given a demonic voice but actually it was his friend Taylor's voice temporarily breaking through I don't know what you're talking about just give me the knife huh 
Give me the knife, Mac. And after awkwardly suffocating Bree, he tells the woman that he's not afraid anymore, which in turn has her give him what I would presume to be the kiss of death, sending him outside. And acting on our words of everyone dies, Mac was the last one left, so he gets pummeled by a Hyundai. And I would like to think perhaps if Mac didn't listen and overcame his issue declaring he was no longer afraid well before this point by going outside, he could have avoided all of this. Even in the end, when the driver kills Mac, he dies telling the driver not to listen. I don't listen. Whatever you do, don't listen. The driver then sees Mac in the doorway and the woman behind him, perhaps implying that Mac would now be to the driver what the intruder was to Mac and the woman driving it all. The story continuing. And that's my analysis. There were obviously some stones left unturned, like the therapist, if he actually died or not. But that's the gist I got after my second viewing. If you have a better theory, please let me know. If you already caught all this by the beginning and you're a fucking genius, well, good for you. Anyways, is this movie still as bad as I thought? No. Not really. The story's pretty good on paper. Maybe I'm just giddy because I feel like I get it. I'm cool. But I think a lot of the things I disliked about it can be somewhat contributed to the budget or lack thereof. I like the main actor's potential, but he kind of jumps all over the place trying to keep his character's traits locked in. And yeah, you could be like, well, he's going crazy, so there's no telling what he'll be like, but I think that's a bit of a cop out. Well, yeah, that's Phobia. A very interesting follow-up to the poltergeist of Borley Forest. And let me clarify, I don't like the movie. I would never watch it in my spare time. I wouldn't even really recommend it. I think I just like the concept and the potential more. So before I was done with Phobia, I decided to listen to the director's commentary that was on the DVD. And it was rather interesting as they cleared up a few small details. The commentary being ran by director Rory and executive producer Elias. First thing I learned, apparently four weeks into shooting Phobia, is when Insidious released a screenshot slash poster of their bride in black character. When these guys already had their character. That sucks. They even comment on the smoking scene where I said this looks like some bullshit. Actually, the funny thing is about this joint, these joints. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we just used regular rolling tobacco for them. But Emma could not roll a joint to no save her say. life. Literally, what we had, what had to happen was Mike would roll the joint, hand it to her. Mm -hmm. We'd call action and she would lick it and finish the roll. And she still managed <laughs> to screw it up every time. That's why all the joints are just like misshapen ugly things and while watching this rory the director is very informative and well uh elias you know like jason is yeah. the only character that could be entirely fictional i mean obviously sandra could be too because she's she's a you know she's not associated with anyone in the real world dude they are but seriously Jason is going the only at it right person. now this is the redeeming part to this commentary anyways through the whole thing i was waiting for somebody to say something about the damn story and they didn't no one said shit about the complexity of it all until the credits hit and elias was like hey so what the fuck does this ending mean what what happened because he didn't even know. You know, so at the end when he's inside the house like that, and he sees himself, uh, I mean, he's looking out, the dude sees him in the house. What What is the answer? What has been yeah, going on? Yeah, I think on? I'm is not sure asking? I ever 100 <laughs> Not that I have oh, a problem I mean, with ambiguity. Well, the thing. I like, like ambiguity. I'm, I'm not curious. I won't say, obviously. You're not going to say? Because the idea was to leave what? it up to the audience. The idea oh, was to leave the you. end. That's a cop out. You got to say. You got to no, say. No, it's not a cop out. You I, have I to know say. exactly what it, what happened at the ending. No, you can tell you exactly what It's a commentary. I'm not going to tell you on this commentary. Yeah, dude. It's not it, fair. <laughs> you gotta say why. No, I mean, because the whole point is. Otherwise, people are gonna say he's full of shit. He didn't have a reason. They're gonna be like, that guy didn't know what he was doing. He just did what he did. All right, fine. You really What's want me to explain reason? what happened there at the ending? Yes. Yes. <laughs> fine. Okay. I, I will now reveal the ending. But see, that ruins it because some someone no, else's doesn't. interpretation might be better than what They're my actual ending is. They're just hearing your perspective. Is. They can think whatever they want. So for me, the way it worked was that. Yeah. Basically, almost everything that happened in the house was real to some extent. Okay. He really killed the, the the home invader. He really killed his therapist. He really killed Andrew. Mm -hmm. What happened was the home invader was infected with the woman in black. She is a malevolent spirit that jumps from person to person oh, and Jason. slowly drives them insane. And when they die, whoever comes in contact with them okay. when they die, she jumps to that person and then begins haunting them. Uh, no. That's it? It's just a ghost? That's your answer? That accounts for everything in the fucking movie? It's just a ghost? 
My version of the movie is way fucking cooler. Final fun fact, and the only thing that keeps me somewhat optimistic with this movie, there were two writers for the script. The original writer, and then the director. And the original writer lived somewhere in New Zealand, and he had little to no communication with the director. He just gave Rory the script, and then Rory put some sauce on it. So I like to think that not even Rory knew what the fuck the original writer was trying to get at. So to the original writer, if you ever come across this video, I get it. I get what you were going for, baby. Baby, baby. Can I still call you Boner? Ha uh ha. -huh. Why don't you suck a fart out of my ass? The Devil Incarnate. The movie was originally titled Kopi, the first entry, and then they realized that title sucked. Later changed to The Devil Incarnate, and also it's, I think it's called Cursed in the UK. Now this movie visually looks a lot better than the last one, but is it actually better? Let's watch it. To introduce the story, they go for the Shrek narration approach, highly effective. There once was a woman named Alina Pachifor, who was raped and left to die. So basically, if you pay attention to this, they say that some lady went through a horrible experience, so she grabbed some, like, witch's amulet, and she wished harm upon those who harmed her. So the devil listened and harmed those people, but he said, only if you give me your baby. So the lady was like, all right, bet, you can have my baby. But then she lied, and she didn't give him the baby. Even though he's a devil, and he's probably fully capable of just fucking killing anything. Not the point. She hid the baby, and then when the baby grew up, he inherited the amulet, and he wanted to start his own family, but he couldn't do it, so he hit up the devil, and he was like, hey, please lift this curse. And the devil was like, alright, you'll be able to have your own child, but only if you kill another random baby. So that's what he did, and they kept that up for generations, and... <laughs> <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Some. This movie is shot found footage style because that makes it spooky. Meet Trevor and Holly. They're driving through beautiful Florida, I think. is Florida, right? I find Boner, but I want to go to every kooky touristy spot on the way then. Wait, did you just call me Boner? Where'd you hear that? I've been talking to your sister. Oh, Jesus. They're driving through beautiful Florida on their honeymoon, and Trevor can't wait to document it all. I love you. Christy! Breaking the rules now, or is this his drone? That's probably his drone. He's probably flying. Yeah, he's probably flying the drone. Sir, right? Is this phone footage, or sir? So this is a mixed bag we're dealing with in this movie. Found footage and just just footage. And in my expert film criticism opinion, it does not work. I would have preferred no found footage at all. The couple go see a medium. That sucks. And then I mean, I wanted a tarot reading. There wasn't exactly a reading. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Let's go. You want to know your future? Is that a black guy in blackface? That's still racist, right? No? The homeless guy tells Holly to follow her spirit, the wind, the trees, to find out about her future. And Holly buys into it and gives the guy a dollar for his troubles. You go enjoy yourself some hubba bubba. I'm glad to know my main character trusts crazy homeless men with knives. I'm looking forward to the rest of her bright decisions later in the movie. So Holly drives around following her spirit and her car breaks down in front of what appears to be another medium's house. This must be the place. Looks like the spirit broke the car. Last stop, buddy, I promise. You know why I'm mad? Because you only have this German Shepherd in this movie to die. This dog is gonna die later in the movie. I'm calling it. I'm fucking calling it. And by it, I mean ASPCA. Stop killing dogs for shock value in horror movies. It's cheap. The lady at this house knows Holly's name and we're not shown what they do inside because we just see Trevor's perspective. He picks up an amulet, the lady freaks out and she summons a jet engine or some shit. Okay, seriously? What the fuck went on in there? Did I miss the part where you guys called a mechanic? I thought your car broke down. So how are you driving it right now, getting away? Is Rusty good with a wrench? Is that how he got his name? The couple was shook and they crashed at a motel.
What kind of shit dog owners are these people? How do you leave your good boy outside of a motel? What kind of ass backwards logic is that? Oh, I'm sorry, do you not want dog fur all over your herpes infested bed? ASPCA. Trevor apparently stole the amulet he looked at and when he brings it out, Holly just comes out dazed looking yummy. What, you think these canines are just for show? Suck on your blood. Laugh out loud. She's taken to the hospital where she's told that she's pregnant. I wonder where this is going. Doesn't go that way. No, doesn't go that way at all. It's about time. I didn't think you were actually coming. Hold on, I'm coming. Hey, Pookie. Ugh, don't call me that. Wait, let me get this straight. You call your sister Pookie and she calls you Boner. Who are you, Yus Benitez? No one gets that reference. Nobody. He's some quasi incesty child predator on Musical.ly. I mean, TikTok. I mean, time's up. Let's move on. So when you're a domestic dad and shit, can I still call you Boner? Uh -huh. Why don't you suck a fart out of my ass? Sucking farts? From yeah. 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 Hey, hey, you don't like sucking farts? Oh, I don't know about all that. You, you're into sucking farts too? No, I don't suck farts. I do eat ass. Pookie finds the amulet and scary music plays. <laughs> Nothing really happens, but... You gotta be like, oh shit, something might happen. Trevor and Holly are boning in broad daylight with the door open. Why don't you suck a fart out of And Pookie ass? records them. Which we later find out is because she's actually crushing on Holly. Earlier, she even hardcore creeped and recorded her exercising. Which I get it, you wanna slap her salami, but like... She's fucking your brother? That's like secondhand incest. Anyways, while she's recording, Holly turns around and looks directly at the camera. And keeps going. And going and going, which is kind of hot, weird. Pookie has a friend who I would have replaced with, with another dog. She randomly FaceTimes her during the movie and I just hate these scenes. What's up girl, how shit? Just talk to yourself. Narrate over this part, please. Doggy. So Holly starts to do the whole I'm possessed thing, little by little. You've all seen it. I don't need to get into the nitty gritty. The family's at dinner and she destroys the baby's room that they surprised her with. And she just stays in the house still. No one takes her to like a hospital or a mental institution. She just had an episode. Pregnancy, am I right? And the movie is pretty forgettable from here on out. I should have declined. You're such a bitch. So what's up, Dyke? How's your crush on your brother's wife coming along? No one fucking talks like that, Becky. All right, this is called break dancing. Oh gosh. Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Holly grabs the dad's dick, cause demons. <laughs> Holly seduces Trevor's sister, which she won't catch me complaining, but I don't understand the importance of it. Well, I get she's being evil, but it just seems like a poor excuse to get a little girl on girl. Holly freaks out while driving Pookie, and through it all, Trevor is the classic knucklehead who doesn't believe the person who thinks something's wrong with his wife. Get out! Get out! Get out! Fucking so Pookie and her whore friend look up Holly and find out she was locked in a closet for years, raped and abused by her foster parents in a location very close to where this crazy lady was. I knew it. When has a dog ever made it out of a horror movie? It's a cheap trick for an extra body. Fuck off. You leave my precious babies alone. So after Holly kills a dog, Trevor finally sees that something's wrong with her. They take her to a hospital and Trevor goes on a rescue mission with Pookie to find the crazy lady again to fix all this. They then discover that the house is no longer there when they go back, so they do what any normal person would do when they realize their wife slash sister-in-law is doomed to die a terrible death and possibly murder others in the process. Yeah, I have a grand slam. Uh, eggs over easy. Extra toast, please. And actually, I asked for decaf. Can you fix that? Please. You guys really thought it was okay to go into a diner bloodied up and smelling like dead puppies. drive through wasn't open. There's, there's gotta be better choices here, guys. Now, I'm no good with all this film buff mumbo jumbo, right? I'm just a guy who really likes picking at movies. It's fun. So forgive me if I'm using this term wrong, but the pacing in this movie 
is gross. You would think Rusty directed it. The whole movie gives you this lead up of Holly slowly becoming more and more possessed. And when she finally goes overboard, proving to her husband that she's off the wall, there's only like 10 minutes left in the movie. So we don't see any type of interaction between Holly and the main characters when they're fully aware that she's gone off the deep end, which maybe would have been kind of interesting. But instead you take her to the hospital, you miraculously find the homeless guy from the beginning, he picks up supplies, you tie your wife up, he throws a few chants out, and the scene cuts. We don't see anything resolved. We barely see the demon fight back. We don't see the emotional moment of Trevor finally having his wife back. It just cuts to the gang driving to the hospital because Holly's going into labor. And here's the ending. Spoiler alert. Great, Richard, great. Push, Holly. Push, push, baby, push. 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 Come on, baby. I don't get it. That just fucked me up even more. What the hell does that mean? So the sister? Is the crazy one now? You know what's weird? I completely flipped my reactions to these movies after my second watches. Because at first, I hated Phobia. I called it a dustpan of a movie. And at first, I liked The Devil Incarnate. I thought it was interesting enough and entertaining enough to just bring it to the end. But then after watching them again, I started to appreciate Phobia more. And I realized how uninteresting The Devil Incarnate really is. There's nothing really going on, which isn't new in a horror movie, but at least the others try to scare us. This movie didn't get the memo. They don't try to scare us. It's just like, hey, she's just getting possessed. This is what's happening. That's it. And the story doesn't even really make sense. I don't get it. And I paid attention to this one, I swear. I even listened to all the crap in the beginning. You can like vaguely be like, yeah, okay, I guess she's doing that because of that. But like all these random fucking reasons don't really tie in together. The movie's answer was just demons. why the guy's wife kiss the sister? Demons! why the homeless guy set him up and then help them afterwards? Demons! Where I do give the movie credit is that it was shot in 13 days and made in a total of like three and a half months on a micro budget. And I may just be naive, but that's pretty impressive for what we get. And also kind of explains why like nothing's fleshed out. And I kind of wish just like the last movie, someone would have actually explained everything for me, just dumbed it down for me, I guess, because it's too fucking smart for me. But all I got after listening to countless interviews was an answer as to why the exorcism scene just cuts and why it's so short. I had two moments where I know that everyone saw me freak out. I remember it was actually, everything was smooth sailing until literally the last day. I knocked before, over a candle. Before, like, no. before you start this, we were like on the 11th hour and we started <laughs> shooting at 7 p.m. It was like five in the morning. So it had been, <laughs> candles that had been knocked over and so there were several announcements made to be careful with the candle and they're getting ready to set up the shot he grabs one of these like flags because he's like yo what i'm gonna try to do is blow the candles out with the flag you know on this one and then i accidentally kicked the candle over and i was like fuck and then like i looked over him and he just threw the flag down on the ground and he walked out the door he goes everyone take five i literally walked outside and my my uh my line producers walking up from getting everyone mcdonald's hey man do you want an egg mcsandwich and like wait i can't fi finish the fucking movie i was like yelling at him and he's like he's like what's wrong and i was like i just can't finish this scene they're knocking over candles i can't fucking do it i said get ryan dean out here now i need ryan dean he looks at me and i was like dude i can't finish this film you gotta help me my brain's mush right now and he's like he's like dude let's just get a shot of her eyes get her screaming and we're out. Bam, boom, beers. I was like, okay, that's what we're gonna do. And I get in there. I'm not gonna call this person out, but I had somebody like come up and she's like, she's like, well, what about the chicken? We gotta kill the chicken. And I, I was like, get out of the room. I want you to leave the room now, please. <laughs> Which is funny when you listen to it, but when you watch the movie, it's not funny. Cause the average viewer doesn't have that context. So it just comes off as very disappointing. I mean, it still is, but at least I can laugh at it now. Uh, I don't mind the acting in this movie. 
you know, except this one, obviously. I actually really like what Gracie Carly did with her role. I think she did a solid job. But yeah, it's an overall okay movie that would probably fit in nice on Netflix. And now my final ratings. Out of this trilogy, I probably dislike the Poltergeist of Borley Forest the most. You can watch my last review as to why. Second in line would be Phobia. There's just more to the story than this fucking hollow chunk of nothing. And my favorite, is yes, somehow the devil incarnate. Although it's the same tired sequence of events, it's just harmless. It's not a big clusterfuck of filler. It looks halfway decent and it at least moves along enough to not put you to bed. All in all, they're all bad, but these two actually surpassed my expectations, not gonna lie. Which may not even be saying a lot to some of you guys, but hey, as a great man once said. Why don't you suck a fart out of my If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching this double feature movie review. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Please leave a like on this one if you did enjoy it. Subscribe because I have more content coming your way. As always, shout out to my new patrons for supporting the boy. I love these movie reviews. I love, I love the balance of having these movie reviews along with everything else. Follow my Twitter if you don't suck and also uh, subscribe to the second channel if you like extras and gaming and shit like that. Fortnite specifically. And also another big thank you to our sponsor, Vikings War of Clans. Don't forget about those links down below. And as always, I am Mr. GG, and I am out. And one more time guys, before we go, sing it with me. Is there something more I could have been to you? Oh, for you. Fuck. Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why don't you suck a fart out of my house? Why'd you suck a fart out of my house? Why'd you suck a fart out of my house? Yeah, I eat that butt like grocery. Yeah, I eat that butt not gross to me. It's gross to you, cause you got the truth. Do do do, cause she got the flu. Like, ayo, ayo.